If you want to open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 29 this morning, we will almost exclusively be in Ezekiel chapter 29, not totally, but mostly. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 29. When I was 16, to the beach in San Diego, I was swimming in the ocean. I was about chest deep in the water, and something in the water bumped me. To move me forward a little bit. Something bumped me and moved me forward. Even though I didn't see what it was, I knew it was a shark. And I'll tell you this, on that particular day, not even Michael Phelps could beat me to shore. I got out of the water as fast as I could, and I did not go back in the water that particular day. It is scary to be in water and to know that there's a monster lurking in the water. You don't know where the monster is. You know he's there. You don't know when the monster is going to attack, but you know that eventually the monster is going to attack. Take a look at Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 1. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Ezekiel receives this message from God in January of 587 B.C. And this is about six or seven months before the destruction of Jerusalem. Take a look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Now, the Pharaohs of Egypt have a long history of being the enemies of God. And Egypt herself has a long history of being an enemy to the people of God. This particular Pharaoh is Pharaoh Hophra. Uh, the Greek historian Herodotus describes Pharaoh Hophra as being uh, proud and extravagant as a ruler. And we're going to see evidence of his pride here in this passage. But God says to Ezekiel, set your face against Pharaoh. What does it mean to set your face against Pharaoh? What that means is, that God is against Pharaoh. And Ezekiel, as the prophet of God, is going to be de just as determined as God is to confront Pharaoh. This is a message against Pharaoh. And you need to be delivering this message. You need to be committed to bringing about the calamity that the message is going to describe. God is dedicated to punishing Egypt for her centuries of rebellion and sin. And God is so determined to bring about this calamity that he describes that there's really nothing that Egypt can do at this point to change what's about to happen. And so set your face against Pharaoh. One of the things we see here in verse 2 is that God is sovereign over the nations of men. God is the ruler of the universe. God is the one who designed the universe. God is the one who created God spoke the universe into existence. God owns the universe. God controls the universe. And every nation that exists on the planet exists under the sovereign of God. Every human king, every human leader must acknowledge that Jehovah is in charge. Every human leader must humble himself before God. Every human leader must depend upon for the power and authority that God has granted that person to have in that moment in time. Every human leader must understand that someday they're going to have to give an account before God for the things that they've done ruling over the people that God has allowed them to rule over. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 says, It is God who removes kings and establishes God has the power to establish a king or to remove a person from office. And God has the power to judge and to punish. 
uh, rulers who have abused their power. Sometimes a human being who comes into power can become too big for his britches and uh, think too highly of himself, which is certainly the case with the pharaohs of Egypt and Pharaoh Hophra. So take a look at verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 3, it says, Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great monster that lies in the midst of his rivers, that has said, My Nile is mine, and I myself have made it. Here we get a glimpse of the arrogance of Hophra. And it's not just but it's really all the pharaohs who have ruled over Egypt because the pharaohs have thought more highly of themselves than they ought to be. The idea that the pharaohs were supernatural beings, not just mere mortal human beings, but actually the perfect blend of human qualities and divine qualities, that the pharaohs were the embodiment of divine qualities. They were like gods to the people that they ruled over. And they were in between the gods and human beings. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus is God with us. Jesus is God in human form. Jesus is the perfect blend of human qualities and divine qualities. And Jesus is the one who intercedes between God and men. The pharaohs of Egypt are not Jesus. And it's blasphemous to put yourself on a same with Jesus. And that's exactly what the pharaohs have been doing. Not just being like Jesus, but even being God, the creator. Pharaoh says, my Nile is mine I have made it. Pharaoh is claiming created the Nile. Really, Pharaoh Hophra? You're the creator of the Nile? You're God, the creator? Do you really believe that? You know, when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, God sent ten plagues upon the land of Egypt. And the first plague that God sent upon the land of Egypt was turning the water into blood. And one of the things that God was teaching Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the Israelites and all the nations that would hear about this is that Pharaoh is not the God of Egypt. Pharaoh is not the creator of anything. The Nile doesn't belong to Pharaoh. The Nile belongs to God. Jehovah is the master of the universe. He created the Nile and he can do whatever he wants with it. And when he turns the water into blood, he takes away life in Egypt. A lot of things, if not everything, is going to die because there's no water in Egypt. The water has been turned into blood. And what God is saying to Pharaoh is, you can't do anything about it because you're not God. You're not me. I alone am God. I alone have power and authority to do with my creation what I choose to do. Egypt was dependent upon the Nile for its life, for its prosperity. And we see here that Pharaoh was described as a great monster. The great monster that lies in the midst of these rivers. Now, there were monsters in the Nile River. There were giant crocodiles in the Nile River. Just very subtly lingering under the surface of the water. You might not even notice that they were there until you came down to get a drink, some water. Or then all of a sudden, you just grab monsters in the Nile River. And... There is an Egyptian tradition that says that the god Amon Re spoke to Pharaoh Thut Moses III, and this is what he said to him I caused them to see thy man as a crocodile, the Lord of fear in the water, 
who cannot be approached. So there was this historical connection between the pharaohs of Egypt and the crocodile. And the crocodile came to be a symbol of the pharaoh of Egypt. Now, the water is the world of his power. The water is where uh, the crocodile thrives. And Pharaoh as well is dependent upon water for his life, for his prosperity, for his power and his authority. If you take him out of the water, or if you take away the water, he loses his power. So take verse 4, Ezekiel 29, verse 4. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your rivers cling to your tail, and I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers. All the fish of your rivers will cling to your scales. God is talking about putting hooks in to Pharaoh's jaws and pulling him out of the water. And what that means is taking away his power. You're not going to be a powerful king. And Egypt is not going to be a powerful country. Because when you're taken out of the water, you have no power, you have no strength. It's like a shark that comes up out of the ocean. Maybe you've seen videos of a shark jumping up onto a boat. Now, the shark doesn't have the same kind of power on land that he does in the water. If the shark jumps up on the boat, I mean, he can wiggle around, he can still, still snap his jaws, he's dangerous, but it's not the same kind of power. And if he doesn't get back into the water, he's going to die. He cannot survive without it. And this is a depiction of the fall of Egypt. Egypt is going to fall. And not just Egypt, but all the little fish who cling to Egypt's scales. All the little fish who cling to the monster scales are the smaller nations and villages and towns and peoples who honor Egypt as a god, who look to Egypt for strength and provision and help in their time of need, and who have rejected the true God who is Jehovah himself. Take a look at verse 5. Ezekiel 29 verse 5. I will abandon you to the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You will fall on the open field. You will not be brought together or gathered. I have given you for food to the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the sky. Without water, Pharaoh will have no strength. He will dry out and die. Egypt will dry up and die. And the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air will feast on Pharaoh's carcass. This is symbolic of the fall of Egypt. Egypt is going to fall. And it is by the power of God. It is by the authority of God. It is by the word of God. It is according to the will of God that this will happen. Take a look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, then all the inhabitants of Egypt will know that I am the Lord because they have been only a staff made of reed to the house of Israel. It is fitting that Egypt would be described as a reed because there were reeds all over Egypt. The Nile was lined with reeds, reeds growing all over the banks of the Nile River. In fact, when Moses is put in a basket and placed into the Nile River, He's placed amongst the reeds, and so he is protected by those reeds, so to speak. He's not going to be taken away by the current and, and lost forever, but he's in a place that, where there are a lot of reeds. But reeds are symbolic of, of Egypt. There were also reeds growing along the banks of the Red Sea. In fact, some places in the Bible describe the Red Sea as the reed sea because it was so full of reeds. So, Egypt and a reed are symbolic of one another. They go together. But what kind of a reed is Egypt? Verse 7 says, When they took hold of you with the hand, you broke and tore all their hands. And when they leaned on you, you broke and made all their loins quake. Israel depended upon Egypt. And when Israel depended upon Egypt, Egypt was not there for her. Egypt was like a reed. And when you grab onto that reed for support, 
the reed breaks and the reed ends up piercing your hand. Or the reed breaks and it ends up piercing you in the hip. And you end up worse off than you were before. Why? Because you trusted in a reed that could not support you. Egypt is a deceiver. Egypt is a false advertiser. It promises strength. It promises support. Support. It promises help. But when you put your faith in Egypt, she does not come through for you. She leaves you hanging. She leaves you desperate. She leaves you in your um, disaster. So, there was a time when the Assyrian army came to Jerusalem. They surround the city of Jerusalem. The Assyrians are laying siege to the city of Jerusalem. The commander of the Assyrian army is Rabshakeh. And Rabshakeh says to the people in Jerusalem, don't trust Egypt. She's not going to save you. Egypt is not coming to the rescue. But what he says about Egypt is recorded by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 36, verse 6. Behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. And how true are the words of Rav Shaka when he's describing Egypt. She is not your savior. She is not your deliverer. She is not coming to the rescue. Later, Zedekiah became king in Jerusalem. There were prophets who told Zedekiah, who spoke to Zedekiah the word of God. God says to Zedekiah through the prophets, you must submit to Babylonian rule and authority. If you humble yourself and submit to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, things will go well for you. But if you rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, then you're rebelling against me and disaster awaits. And so what does Zedekiah do? He rebels against Babylon. He rejects the word of God and rebels against Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem and he brings his army and they're laying siege to the city of Jerusalem. And in his time of desperation... Zedekiah sends a messenger to Egypt, pleading for help from Egypt. Egypt, come and rescue us. Come and deliver us. Come and save us. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 9 and 10 says this. I'm sorry, that's not where I'm at. Jeremiah 37, verse 5. I disappointed that I skipped over Isaiah 51, 9 and 10. I should have used that like five minutes ago in the sermon. This is a good point. Jeremiah 37, verse 5. All right, Zedekiah, he appeals to Egypt for help. What happened? Jeremiah 37, verse 5. When the Chaldeans who had been besieging Jerusalem heard the report about them, they lifted the siege from Jerusalem. Pharaoh Hophra says... I'm going to help Jerusalem. He sends the Egyptian army up to Jerusalem to fight against the Babylonians. The Babylonians are laying siege to Jerusalem. They hear that the Egyptians are coming and the Babylonians leave Jerusalem. They run away. They don't want to fight against Egypt, so they leave. So Zedekiah's plan worked. Egypt rescued Jerusalem. Hooray! It's a great day for the, the people of God, but not so fast, because that's not the end of the story. There's a prophet in Jerusalem. The prophet is Jeremiah, and Jeremiah says to the king, in Jeremiah 37, verses 7 and 8, Pharaoh's army, which has come out for your assistance, is going to return to its own land of Egypt. The Chaldeans will also return and fight against this city, and they will capture it and burn it with fire. You have not been delivered. You have not been rescued. And Egypt is not going to be here for the long haul. Egypt doesn't really care about you. Egypt is going to go home. And when Egypt leaves, the Babylonians return. And when the Babylonians return, Jerusalem will be destroyed. 
And so when the Egyptians left, the Babylonians returned and they laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And at that time, the suffering in Jerusalem was as great as any suffering anyone has ever experienced. There was famine in the city. People were starving to death. There was nothing to eat. And there was death and destruction everywhere. Now, this was Israel's sin. Israel should not have trusted in Egypt. The prophet Isaiah has already warned Israel. In Isaiah 31 verse 1, Isaiah says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Don't be deceived by the size of Egypt's army. Don't be deceived by their horses and chariots and soldiers and think that Egypt can deliver you. Don't make an idol out of Egypt and reject God. That's exactly what the Israelites did. Instead of putting their faith in God, instead of appealing to God to come to the rescue, they appealed to Egypt. They made Egypt an idol. They used Egypt as a replacement for God himself. And the prophet Isaiah warned them, do not make an idol out of Egypt. Now the Israelites are going to be punished for their own sins. But Egypt has elevated herself to such a status that she is seen as an alternative to God. We can trust in God or we can trust in Egypt. And she's deceiving the nations. People who don't know about God or people who, who might know something about God view Egypt as more reliable than God himself. And so they're trusting in Egypt. They're depending upon Egypt. But Egypt is like that reed that cannot support your weight. And you put your weight down on it, it's going to snap and it's going to pierce you and you're going to hurt as a result of it. Egypt claimed to be God. Egypt claimed to be the creator. Egypt claimed to be a savior. And she was none of these things. And so because of the blasphemy of Egypt, God cannot ignore her sins forever. And there comes a point where God says, I must deal with Egypt. So turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 24 to 26. Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 24 to 26. The Bible says in Ezekiel 30, verse 24, For I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. And I will break the arms of Pharaoh so that he will groan before him with the groanings of a wounded man. Thus I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon but the arms of Pharaoh will fall. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. When I scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the lands, then they will know that I am the Lord. There are two things I want to point out here. One is God is in control. God has the power to strengthen whomever he wants and to weaken whomever he wants. I will strengthen Nebuchadnezzar, I will strengthen Babylon, and I will weaken Pharaoh, and I will weaken Egypt. God has the power and the authority and the right to do this because he is the master of the universe. It all belongs to him. And he is infinitely wise and righteous and just in the decisions that he makes. Babylon does not conquer Egypt because Babylon is greater than Egypt. Babylon conquers Egypt because Egypt was so sinful that God used Babylon to accomplish his purposes. And this is the second point. God says, I will put my sword in Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Nebuchadnezzar wields the sword. The Babylonian army, they come and they, they have weapons and swords and spears and weapons. But those weapons, those swords are God's sword. 
It was God who put the sword in Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And the Babylonians, even though they don't realize it, they're servants of Jehovah. They are accomplishing the will of God. God is working through them to accomplish his purposes. So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon you a sword, and I will cut off from you man and beast. Where is God in this verse, verse 8? Where is God? God is there in Egypt. God does not say, I will send a sword against you as if God is somewhere else. God says, I will bring a sword against you, as if God himself is present in everything that's going on. The punishment that's going to come upon Egypt, the fall of Egypt, God is there working out his purposes. And the sword that he brings, he brings it by means of the Babylonian army, which come to Egypt to destroy Egypt. Now, take a look at verse 6. Ezekiel 29, verse 6. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt will know that I am the Lord. And verse 9. Verse 9 says, The land of Egypt will become a desolation and waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Why must this take place? Why is this going to happen? It's for the sake of knowledge. The Egyptians do not know that Jehovah is God. They think that Pharaoh is God. Pharaoh thinks, I am God. The Nile is mine. I have made it. I am the creator. And the nations around Egypt have been deceived by Egypt's power into believing that Egypt is my God. Egypt is my savior. Egypt is my deliverer. And God says, the world must know that I am God. How are they going to know that I am God? I'm going to have to take this imposter and break him and demonstrate that I alone have the authority to rule over the nations. I can strengthen whom I choose. I can weaken whom I choose. And unfortunately, some people will never acknowledge the sovereignty of God until they hit rock bottom. And that's what God must do to Egypt. So that those who survive, those who remain, might recognize the fact that Jehovah is the true God. Israel did not know God. Israel was deceived by Egypt's power and beauty. Israel believed that Egypt could rescue us. Instead of turning to God for help, she turned to Egypt. And God says, my people will never again make that mistake. The mistake of trusting in Egypt instead of trusting in me. Egypt will never again be a great world power. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. 15 and 16. It will be the lowest of the kingdoms, and it will never again lift itself up above the nations. And I will make them so small that they will not rule over the nations. And it will never again be the confidence of the house of Israel, bringing to mind the iniquity of their having turned to Egypt. Then they will know that I am the Lord, God. Israel will know that Jehovah is God when she sees what God does to Egypt. Now, Take a look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald. Every shoulder was rubbed bare. But he and his army had no wages from Tyre for the labor that he had performed against it. Tyre is a city north of Israel. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, Tyre, there are two parts to the city of Tyre. So half of the city was built on the continent. 
and then half of the city was built on an island that was about one or two miles away from the mainland. And Tyre was a very rich city, a very wealthy city. Tyre was all about commerce and making money and economic prosperity. So the city was wealthy, the people were wealthy, and they were dedicated to the pursuit of money. That's what Tyre was all about. And God used the Babylonians to punish Tyre. So, in the year 571 BC, Nebuchadnezzar takes his army to Tyre. And they lay siege to the city of Tyre. But they cannot lay siege to the part of the city that's on the island. It's only the part of the city that's on the mainland that they are laying siege to. And that siege lasted for 13 years. Can you imagine that? Laying siege to a city for 13 years. And the work was so strenuous that all the soldiers in the Babylonian army were bald. They were bald because the helmets that they wore for 13 years while they were laying siege to the city rubbed their heads bald. And the armor that they wore rubbed their shoulders to the point where their shoulders were rubbed raw. But there was no reward for Babylon because all the wealth of Tyre was moved to the island. And so the Babylonians destroyed half of the city. The half that was on the continent was completely destroyed. But there were no spoils to be gleaned by the Babylonians. Everything had been moved to the island. Now the Babylonians were not able to get to the island because Pharaoh Hophra sent Egypt's navy to protect the island. Not just to protect the island, but to steal the riches of Tyre for themselves. All those treasures that were taken to the island were eventually loaded onto the Egyptian boats and were brought back to Egypt. Now, Egypt has all of Tyre's wealth, and the Babylonians who did all this work, God was using them to accomplish his purposes. They had no reward for their work. 13 years of work and no reward. So take a look at verses 19 and 20. Verse 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will carry off her wealth and capture her spoil and seize her plunder, and it will be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, which he performed, because they acted for me, declares the Lord God. Eventually, Babylon will be recompensed for all of her work, and it will come at Egypt's expense. Now, this chapter ends with hope for the people of God. Take a look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, On that day I will make a horn sprout for the house of Israel, and I will open your mouth in their midst. Then they will know that I am the Lord. On that day. What day does that day refer to? On that day. The truth is, I don't know. There is coming a day when something good is going to happen for the people of God. What day is that? Maybe the context suggests that we're talking about the day when the Babylonians destroy Egypt. So, it says that on that day, I will make a horn sprout for the house of Israel. A horn often symbolizes power or authority or in some cases, even a specific king. A king will rise up and this king will act favorably for the people of God. This king will be a blessing to the people of God. So who is the horn that's going to rise up and be a blessing to the people of God? Some have suggested that it's Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. How would Nebuchadnezzar be a blessing to the people of God? Well, on that day, Nebuchadnezzar will destroy Egypt. And Egypt has been historically the enemy of the people of God. So the one who defeats my enemy is actually my friend and a blessing to me. 
I don't know if it's Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar is literally going to turn around and destroy the city of Jerusalem. So that wasn't much of a blessing for the people of God in Jerusalem. Some have suggested that maybe this horn is Cyrus. Seventy years later, Cyrus is going to be the king of Persia. And Cyrus is going to pass a law and he's going to set the, the Jews free who have been living in exile for 70 years. And he's going to say, go back home. Go back to Jerusalem and build a house for the glory of God. And maybe Cyrus is the horn who, who blesses the people of God. However, notice what verse 21 says. On that day, I will make a horn sprout for the house of Israel. The idea of a horn sprouting, this is messianic language. We see this language all throughout the, the Old Testament. There's this idea that a branch or a shoot or a sprout will come up and will be a blessing for the people of God and it's messianic in nature. Maybe this is a prophecy about Jesus. So, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. And we'll read verses 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Jesse is David's father. Someone is coming through the line of Jesse and David who is going to be the Messiah. And Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He is a branch or a shoot that will spring forth. And he goes on to say, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see. Nor make a decision by what he, his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor. And decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 6. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 6. And we'll read verses 12 and 13. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Zechariah 6, verse 12. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest, on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. A branch is going to sprout, and he's going to build the temple of God. The temple of God, by the way, is the church. And he's going to be a king, and he's going to sit on the throne. But not only is he going to be a king, he is also going to be a priest. The, the offices of king and priest will be united in one man, the Messiah. The Christ, Jesus, the hope for the people of God. The Israelites did not fully know God. They rejected God and instead trusted in Egypt. They made Egypt her, their God. And the Egyptians did not know who God was. They thought Pharaoh was God. They were so self-deluded, the pharaohs, that they believed that they were God in human form. And God is going to bring Egypt to her knees so that Egypt will know, so that the nations will know, so that Israel will know that Jehovah 
is God. Let us not be like Egypt. Let us not be like Israel at this time, believing in these idols who claim to be God, who claim to be a Savior, who claim to be a deliverer when they are not. But we must know that Jehovah is God. The Bible says in John 17, verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And if you're searching for God, and if you're searching for the Savior, we want to help you find him. Jesus is Lord and God. He is our Savior. And if you would like to study more about that, we invite you to come forward at this time as we stand and sing the invitation song.